morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. And a warm welcome to all our participants joining us for this webinar. My name is Sia, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Association of Aerospace Industries Singapore, and it's my pleasure to act as your host today. This session is the ITAP 2021 Aerospace Industry Segment at the Digital Sandbox. And as the title suggests, we will be focusing on the aerospace industry, how it is weathering the pandemic, and what this means for digital transformation. As a background, let me offer a few insights into the impact of the pandemic on the global aviation and aerospace industry and the progress of its recovery. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a long and deep impact on aviation. Just 1.8 billion passengers flew in 2020, a decrease of 60% compared with the 4.5 billion who flew in 2019. Passenger revenues for airlines fell 69% in 2020, and airlines suffered record losses, totaling US $126 billion. The good news, though, is that air cargo has recovered above 2019 levels, and is expected to be strong going into 2022. Domestic travel is also well on the road to recovery, particularly in the Americas, Europe, China. Airline net losses are expected to shrink to around $50 billion in 2021, and further reduce to $12 billion in 2022. So I would expect that the airlines will turn the corner in 2023. Now, having said this, uh, recovery across the globe is uneven, and especially for Asia-Pacific airlines, which are impacted by stricter government regulations compared to, say, in Europe or in North America. Uh, and Southeast Asian airlines are in a particularly precarious position, having a greater dependency on uh, international travel. So today we can say that there are some strong signposts to recovery. You know, uh, looking at the developed world, for example, there is uh, good progress in vaccinations and uh, borders have been reopening in major markets. Um, granted that the reopenings are not uh, uniform and vaccinations are still uh, at, you know, very uh, slow pace in some less developed parts of the world. Um, and then governments in Asia have generally come to accept that uh, they have to learn to live with COVID. Um, so the zero COVID strategy is not something that can be sustained for the long term. Uh, perhaps a notable exception though is China, which is still on the path of a zero COVID strategy. Um, in terms of Singapore, as an example, uh, we've launched vaccinated travel lanes for quite a number of countries already, uh, albeit rather cautiously, and uh, with vaccinations above 80% now, we're on a strong path towards reopening. Uh, having said that, we do expect some hiccups along the way, some slowdowns, maybe even uh, temporary reversals. But I guess that's really the nature of the pandemic and the uncertainty that remains. The next segment will be a panel discussion entitled Creating New Value Propositions for the Asia-Pacific Aerospace Ecosystem with uh, Industry 4.0. Uh, joining me on the panel, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, first my friend, Mr. Najib Mohamed Noor from Malaysia. Uh, Najib is a Chief Executive Officer of Strand Aerospace Malaysia and President of the Malaysia Aerospace Industry Association, more fondly called Maya. He began his career growing a UK aerospace startup and then returned to Malaysia to build Strand Aerospace Malaysia. Uh, which is an organization in uh, design and analysis uh, engineering services. Uh, Najib has been active as an engineer, a technologist, a business developer uh, in the global aerospace supply chain since 2000. So we're really looking forward to hear his uh, stories and his insights uh, in the coming discussion. Uh, secondly, I also like to introduce my friend, uh, Mr. Hanakata San. Uh, General Manager of the Society of Japan uh, of Japanese Aerospace Companies, otherwise known as SJAC, 
Hanakata san started his career at the procurement department of an aerospace manufacturing company and subsequently moved on to MRO and strategic planning. He joined SJAC in 2017 as general manager for international affairs and has been responsible for this uh, area of international affairs, including support for Japanese SMEs in the international markets. So welcome, uh, Najib and uh, Hanakata san. Thank you. Uh, Let's start by talking about the state of the aerospace industry in our respective countries, Malaysia, Japan, and Singapore, and also the impact of the pandemic. Uh, perhaps Najib, as my close neighbor, can I invite you to start with an introduction to Maya and then discuss a little bit about the state of the industry in Malaysia? Sure. Uh, thank you, Sia, for the uh, very kind introduction. I'm very pleased to be here. and. Um, give you an update of where we are in, in Malaysia with the industry. So the Malaysian Aerospace Industry Association today represents, uh, at last count, about 80, is 83 companies now. Um, so those range from the very large um, Safran's, uh, Spirit Air Systems, um, down to the uh, smaller SMEs, uh, which could be up to a three, four men uh, outfit, uh, providing parts or services for manufacturing MRO. Um, we were founded uh, in 2016, um, and uh, since then, uh, we've become quite central to sort of the government's strategy in aerospace industry development. Uh, so we've just recently launched the 12th Malaysia Plan, and the 12th Malaysia Plan uh, is the first Malaysia Plan with the aerospace industry as a specific focus area, um, and uh, it now carries a a role in uh, propelling the industries, uh, the country, sorry, uh, industry 4.0 strategy going forward. So just prior to the pandemic hitting uh, in 2019, uh, we were at uh, 16.2 billion ringgit uh, revenue um, from both the manufacturing and the MRO uh, industry. Um, and that dropped down to up to between 30 to 50%, depending on the organization we were talking about. Um, so base load for MRO uh, came down tremendously. I think the MRO base load was the, the heaviest hit, obviously. So down by up to 55%, uh, I think on average. Um, and manufacturing, um, we were very heavy for the A320 um, and, and the 737 as well. Uh, that came down by about, to about the rate 35 or 33, I think at the at the lowest rate, uh, whereas previously was up to rate 64, 65, if I recall. Um, so uh, it was tough. Uh, there was a lot of retrenchment. Uh, I think we lost uh, upwards of 3,000, so very skilled workers that then sort of went back into the uh, ecosystem of Malaysia, if you like. Uh, but we started to recover uh, early in this year, I think um, there was an air of pessimism um, sort of uh, very early in the year, uh, but that's slowly now turned into a very, uh, I would say even, you know, um, more than a cautious optimism uh, going forward. Uh, I think two major things that has happened is that the A320 rate um, is now quite healthy at about 43 um, and it looks like uh, it should hit the 50s by sort of end of next year. Uh, and again, that's 60% of our production capacity. Um, and uh, GE Engine Services uh, has had a, a good run in recovery with uh, work being uh, rerouted, I think, to Malaysia uh, because of quality. Uh, and I think obviously Singapore has a benefit from that because the, uh, the components repair, a lot of that is done uh, down in Singapore after the, uh, the engine is taken apart in Subang. So, um, so GE um, and CTRM, uh, Spirit Air Systems, they look to be you know, near sort of recovered rates by 2022, I think mid off. Uh, I think optimistically that, that, that could be there back to sort of uh, 60 odd rate levels for production. Uh, GE seems to be um, potentially on course for a full recovery to 2019 levels by the same sort of time. Um, but what we're anticipating as we have presented to our uh, ministers, uh, particularly the Minister of Finance, the Kuzafro, is we expect an exponential um, 
return um, of the industry due to during the pandemic, uh, very high levels of bidding happening. So uh, several billion ringgits worth of bidding was happening during the pandemic. Um, and I'm proud to say two days ago, we launched the first A321 extra long range flap, uh, single source manufacture in Subang. So, um, so watch this space. I think uh, we're on, on to a recovery. Uh, but as you said, you know, uh, the pandemic uh, is not fully uh, understood yet. <laughs> so we will have to make sure that we plan uh, and react accordingly. Uh, thank you, Najib, for that uh, quite interesting uh, explanation of where the industry stands. And of course, we're also very heartened to learn how the recovery has uh, begun uh, in Malaysia. Uh, may I now invite uh, Hanakata-san to share your, your perspective on the Japanese industry too. Yeah. Hey, thank, you. thank you for your introduction. Uh, I'm very pleased to participate in this event. So first of all, I'd like to introduce our SJAC. Uh, what is this? The, the Society of Japanese Aerospace Companies. Uh, the, it, uh, this is a sole public entity uh, this, uh, representing the interest of Japanese aerospace industries. SJAC was established with the purpose of contributing the expansion of Japanese aerospace industries. Uh, it was founded in 1952 at the re re opening the year of Japanese aviation industry as a private forum for aircraft industries. And then our member uh, companies is around 140, 140 companies, which consist, consist of manufacturing, MRO materials, and trading and finance like that. Also SME Support is one of the uh, activities to so providing the information and uh, using the website for kind of communities we are providing. Also, SJAC is a, an organizer of Japanese uh, international aerospace exhibitions. Uh, now we are planning to host the exhibition in 2024. 20, 2024 now we plan. As for the current situation in Japan overall, as a vaccination rate in Japan now reached to more than 70%. Singapore is likely 80 or more, I guess. But current then current circumstances in Japan have been stabilized. The state of emergency has been lifted in October and border guarantee control measures. Uh, getting relaxed. However, we are very careful to prevent another wave of pandemic. Uh, everybody is wearing masks when they go outside or taking public transportation. Then uh, our aerospace industries. Yes, Japanese aerospace industries also have been affected seriously by this COVID pandemics at the same as other uh, country industries. I suppose our sales volume have been reached to 20 billion US dollars before COVID pandemic, but it will be 30% less, at least in this year. Uh, as Nagi explained for the wide body segment, continue, continue to be serious condition, but engine segment, including spare parts are getting recovery. And the narrow body segment are starting to recover. That is our situation. Also, we have a defense side, the space side uh, we have. So segment is uh, supported by the government funding. That was a stabilized, not so much affected as a COVID. That's our situation. So back to you, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Anagata san, for the insight. And again, I'm encouraged to see how recovery has begun uh, already in the uh, Japanese industry. And, uh, and of course, very important that the emergency has been lifted. <laughs> um, so let me just offer a few remarks on the Singapore situation. Uh, firstly, during the pandemic, uh, right at the start, the industry was identified as, a, as an essential service to support the aviation hub at Changi, 
uh, and hence we were able to continue our operations um, with uh, relatively minimal disruptions uh, throughout uh, the lockdown periods and since. And uh, also in uh, May last year, we were designated with the tier one support under the job support scheme. This is basically a government uh, support for every employee that's uh, um, uh, in the company. And uh, we receive uh, double the amount of support versus other industries on a per employee basis. So this really indicates to you how uh, important the industry is viewed uh, in Singapore. And certainly as an island, right? We're very dependent on uh, aviation as well as uh, maritime uh, for the maintenance of supply chains. So, so this explains also why this is such a significant industry for us. Um, the monthly index of production, I would say in 2020 fell to about 60 to 70% of 2019 levels. Uh, and uh, this year it is in the range of 75 to 80%. So, so the impact you can see has been um, 20 to 30% uh, in general. And, and it's recovering. Uh, the growth in terms of output in uh, September this year, compared to September last year, is about 21, 22%. Right? So, so I think uh, these indicate uh, that the recovery is indeed uh, starting to take hold. And we're seeing the progress being made first with the engine overhaul companies, but also because of the strong recovery of air cargo um, as the engineering, for example, is uh, you know, one of the major uh, companies converting passenger to freighter uh, aircraft. Um, and they are seeing a boom in that particular part of the business as well, uh, the PTF business. So these are all, I think, positive signs. Um, in terms of the size of the industry, pre-pandemic, it was uh, about 12 plus billion Singapore dollars, employing about 22 thousand people. Um, the the uh, employment impact has been such that I think we've by and large been able to maintain our core capabilities throughout the pandemic because of the job support scheme uh, that we enjoyed. Um, and that will help us position ourselves better for the recovery. Uh, but having said that, we are uh, have started to hire so the Ministry of Manpower recently announced that uh, the aerospace industry is expected to hire about 1,000 people over the next two years. Right? And this year alone, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing uh, pretty big numbers, <laughs> but particularly from the engine and the PTF sectors. Okay, so that's the uh, situation in Singapore. Now let's uh, turn our discussion to um, uh, the topic for the day, really, which is about digital transformation, right? I four point zero. Um, and may I just ask uh, you then, you know, what are some of the challenges the industry is facing in the digitalization drive? And uh, you know, again, how would you rate, you know, our progress in the I four point zero journey? Um, Najib, would you like to give it a shot first? Sure. Um, so that's an interesting question because. Um, I, if I, uh, I'd like to sort of recall when we were on the A350 program not so many years ago now, many, many probably many years ago now, but it feels like it was yesterday. Um, and, uh, and that was a, a major shift in, in sort of Airbus uh, methodology of uh, developing and manufacturing aircraft. Uh, there you saw a fully composite uh, fuselage um, section being manufactured. Uh, but I think what many people did not see as well was a lot of digitization that was beginning to happen in the background. So I, being a stress engineer, I remember all the, uh, the tools that we were running um, uh, had been changed into new uh, platform-based tools, which was quite a major disruption. Um, and I think procurement, uh, documentation, uh, certification processes all had a lot more digitization associated with them. Um, and that's when I was sort of a baptism of fire of, you know, how Airbus will throw everything in the kitchen sink into it to, to get this to work right? and, uh, and, and goes for very big transformations 
um, to make sure that their products are sort of the forefront of, of competitive um, aviation uh, products, right? So um, now when you come to today, um, uh, it's very much a, a, a new um, perspective post-COVID. Um, we had a webinar uh, in Malaysia where we uh, invited um, some speakers. Um, uh, so we had the head of operations for Asia Pacific from Airbus, um, Collins Aerospace, and a few others. And um, there was a major push for uh, decarbonization. Right? I think the target by 2050 is to zero rise to 1990 or 1995 sort of levels. Um, I think this is the, the the real driver, which perhaps not many people have yet woken up to, in that that drive for decarbonization and the 2030 um, goal to have zero emissions aircraft in the air um, will drive a lot of um, design requirements and production requirements, which uh, we have not yet seen. You know, and uh, if I if I liken it to the 350, where you know it was all changed at all the same time. I suspect that this requirement um, uh, is going to be quite substantive from Airbus and Lee, and I'm sure Boeing will be um, uh, very, not very far along uh, along the same line. So then it comes to the question of readiness of the supply chain. Uh, and I unfortunately, I think at the sort of SME levels for Malaysia, we are still very much what I would say traditional, you know, in our <laughs> production uh, methodologies, capacities. Um, uh, the Minister of International Trade of Malaysia uh, just yes, uh, day before yesterday launched the My Aero Summit uh, in Kuala Lumpur uh, and it was a very clear um, uh, message that he sent to the SMEs that, you know, this industry requires you to digitize in ways that you've, uh, you've not yet considered. Um, this is not an incremental change. This will be um, an exponential change, as with most things that are going to be happening from now on. Um, and I think this is a, a space to watch at the moment because um, it's not just the case of uh, adopting digital processes or practices or equipment. Uh, it is a mindset change, fundamentally. Uh, and if I recall at the last ITAP, you know, when I walked the floor, uh, it's in Singapore and talking to the SMEs, you know, who are attending it. Uh, I think between Singapore and Malaysia, I don't think there's that much difference in terms of the, you know, SMEs readiness for, for such a um, abrupt change, right? So, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting. The book is still being written um, and, and the players are still, <laughs> are still figuring out what their roles are going to be. So, so Najib, if I can, can read between the lines of what you're saying, is that uh, you're seeing that the OEMs, for example, right, will be the major driver uh, to, to require you know, their supply chain to also adopt uh, digitalization to give themselves that visibility all the way across the, uh, the supply chain. And uh, you know, the challenge is really for the SMEs especially to, to respond to that because it does mean quite a major change in in yeah. the way they do, uh, and you know, tradition dies hard. <laughs> yes, yes. I think I think we can all identify, you know, some similarities. <laughs> what about Hanakada-san in Japan? Uh, how's that? I, I mean, it's a big country, and I, I yeah. expect that different regions, <laughs> no, no, different no. rates of progress. Yeah, in Japan is uh, now Japan digital agency uh, started established in this September. They are responsible to handle all uh, government strategies for digitalization. That is a very first very impact. So also a uh, web meeting uh, has been introduced very widely for in Japan, taking this for COVID timings. One, one interesting is uh, uh, typical. So uh, recently Japanese stamp, Hanko, Hanko has been abolishing from the Japanese government paper and applications. That's a very interesting one. The application itself have been changing from paper one to digital ones. That is a, a country wide. As for Japanese aerospace industries, yeah, digitalization have been developed to so widely for major companies. Yeah, but it will probably take some more time to develop to, into SMEs. Uh, we are uh, thinking uh, 
デジタライゼーション will be able to not only accumulating information,、uh, but also、uh, analyzing information for, you, for utilizing the data.、Uh, however, I think it will take more effort and innovation for us、uh, to the utilizing the data. As if also education and training for digitalization will be required for Japanese air industries. Uh, for SMEs, our medium size also required. That is the current situation. Yeah. Back to you.、Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Hanakada san. So that means,、uh, um, I suppose, the setup of this government agency is a major milestone, right? Because that will drive、uh, strategy, it will also drive government digitalization, which in turn will flow down to businesses, right? Uh, I think in, in our country's government often sets the pace <laughs> of change as well. So, so that's a very significant move.、Uh, in the case of Singapore,、uh, you know, I think we, we started quite early internally to identify digital transformation as an important competitive、uh, capability、um, across all industries. And since I think 2016, 2017, there have been a series of over 20 so called industry transformation maps launched by government in conjunction with, you know,、uh, with, uh, with industry、uh, to direct that change. So there is an industry transformation map for aerospace, for example, right? And, and、uh, this is our,、uh, our guide to. Transformation.、Um, so, aspiration is one thing. So, the question is what's the practice、um, to enable us on this journey?、Um, uh, the government also developed this Smart Industry Readiness Index, which is a wonderful tool that measures multiple dimensions of one's、uh, readiness、uh, for digitalization. And we can use that then to gauge you know, which areas、uh, we need to focus on. In our journey. So it could be a cultural issue or, or people you know, readiness because you can invest in equipment and software, but if the people themselves you know, have not got that so called digital intelligence, right, then we're not moving as an organization. So, so I think this、uh, readiness index, which we call Siri, sounds like Apple, but you know, it's a different thing, uh, uh, is, is quite a powerful tool. And I'm, I'm glad. Hear that it's been adopted also by the World Economic Forum and is now practiced quite widely across the globe, too.、Um, the aerospace industry during the downtime,、uh, I know, has been investing quite significantly in digital transformation projects.、Uh, the, our association did a survey、uh, in the fourth quarter, third, fourth quarter last year.、Um, You know, to gauge what is happening in terms of the manpower situation, in terms of what companies are prioritizing during the downtime. And the feedback was that the most of them were engaging in、uh, transformation and improvement projects. So that was heartening, right? Because when you have a bunch of engineers, but not a whole lot of work to do, right,、uh, it, it makes sense to use that time to implement these、uh, improvements.、Uh, And、uh, we have seen a number of companies establish、uh, centers of excellence to drive、uh, I 4.0 adoption on the shop floor because you know, you've got to come up with new digital technology sometimes to apply.、Uh, some, some processes, for example, are now using AI,、um, and uh, even uh, repairs uh, using 3D printing or additive manufacturing、uh, have also been implemented in some of the shops in Singapore. Um, regarding SMEs, I think we know they, they face、uh, resource constraints, particularly since you know, there's an investment in terms of、uh, manpower and、uh, you know, having the right people to enable the transformation, as well as、uh, you know, financial investment. Right? And、uh, fortunately, there have been very strong government support. And, Um, I've been speaking to a few of our SFEs,、uh, those in the aerospace sector, and quite heartened to see that they have implemented some levels of,、uh, shall we say,、uh, digital technology on the shop floor.、Um, so, one company、uh, has invited me to visit their new 
automated uh, surface finishing line. Uh, so that, that's something uh, for an SME, I think quite an achievement. Um, and uh, I know another one has been uh, working on, for example, using uh, uh, 3D printing for masking of parts. Right? So that's also uh, you know, quite interesting for an SME to have invested in this and they have, uh, uh, well, they don't call it CTO, but you know, as I see it, that's the role he's playing <laughs> within the SME. So these are encouraging. I, I would have to say it's by no means across the board. Um, so, you know, there is a great range in terms of how quickly companies are moving. Uh, but it's, it's a good first sign. <laughs> I'm sure you'll agree. Um, finally, to, to end our, our little panel discussion here, uh, I wonder if you would have a few words to say also about how we as associations can support uh, our members in their drive towards adopting I-4.0. Um, and hoping to tap your ideas. <laughs> Pardon me for borrowing some of those good ideas that you might share. <laughs> Imagine. Yes, uh, Malaysia is always happy to help Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> and vice versa. <laughs> so, um, I think since the establishment of the association, prior, prior to that, we were uh, very much in silo. I think the industry was very much in silo. So it was individual sort of large companies um, which were you know, uh, trying to serve uh, what interests that they had uh, and, and trying to build a supply chain specific to themselves you know, in the country, right? whether that be MRO or manufacturing. Um, the association has been able to pull together and um, sort of, in the first case, highlight what are the um, joint issues that we sh that we share, and uh, I think that's been very enlightening to a lot of the members. Um, in that, you know, they've always been looking at each other from across the pond, if you like, um, and and then you know, to sit at the same table as friends and and discuss these issues um, and openly and frankly um, has helped quite a lot. Um, and so, one of the, the key results for that has been um, the recovery plan that we jointly put together. Um, and that we presented that to the government as an association uh, uh, of companies um, representing a revenue potential for the government. You know, now that helped a lot because that uh, resulted in some budget allocations in the just just launched 12 Malaysia Plan budget. So um, I think from from uh, from that point of view, uh, the uh, cohesiveness of the industry now is is much better. Um, the key thing now, I think, as we've discussed these digitalization challenges that we're facing, there is uh, a lot of, uh, sort of, shall I say, collaborative brain power required to anticipate what this requirement will really be on the ground. Uh, because, um, like I mentioned with the A350 program, you know, um, I think the OEMs have uh, uh, aspirations which they execute by a very large organization um, which means that uh, uh, sometimes coherence isn't always there um, and therefore it expects the supply chain to be able to keep up with sort of the, the evolving landscape and, uh, and uh, the evolving issues that will arise and that becomes um, this value chain. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I think uh, that, that's, that's really the... the uh, the role that the association uh, is going to be playing uh, for Malaysian industry uh, in the next five years, I think, you know, try and coordinate us uh, so that we can respond to what the, uh, the requirements will be coming in from outside. Good. What about the, uh, I think, I think that's definitely a good idea. Uh, I think mm -hmm. as the voice of industry and, and it must be very rewarding to see how your efforts have been translated into the Malaysia plan as well. Um, that's quite an achievement. So my congratulations to Maya. <laughs> uh, how about in uh, in Japan? Uh, do you yep. think uh, you know there's something that SJEC can do uh, yep. to help drive this? Yeah. Uh, the association, I would like to three point. Uh, I'd like to say one one thing is uh, uh, sharing the success case. Success case as case study is the very useful method, I guess. And second is uh, as Nagib San says, approach to government for authorities, for regulation-wise and budgetary-wise. And the third is support the education and the training for member companies. Those three points I would like to. 
Mm. Yeah. Thank you. That's okay. That's um, three good ideas. I can definitely take that back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think, uh, you know, in the Singapore context, of course, um, we have been working with the Economic Development Board on the Industry Transformation Map. I mentioned that the aerospace uh, 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 plan was uh, launched a few years back. And uh, this year, we started working with them on a joint study that will feed into the 2.0 version of it. Um, which we expect uh, will be implemented uh, starting from next year. Uh, but in reality, of course, it's a continuum. Right? It's not, it's not uh, discrete. Um, the other thing is uh, partnerships, uh, working with the industry to promote digitalization. We've been conducting digital learning journeys to uh, other industries, for example, that, that may have uh, good examples of how I4.0 has implemented on the shop floor. And so we've done quite a lot of uh, such journeys pre-COVID. Uh, unfortunately, during COVID, we can't quite visit other companies. Um, so that's taken a pause. Uh, but we had a very strong response there. Um, and then, you know, uh, there's also been an interesting program uh, launched by the Singapore Business Federation together with uh, McKinsey and Ernst & Young, which will help companies uh, on an eight-week program uh, to, to also then adopt digitalization, but in a holistic manner. And, and uh, with, uh, shall we say, it's not classroom work, right? There's a practical implementation uh, driving change uh, in the company as well. So that's why it's such a long program. Um, and I think this will make for lasting change too. So uh, with that, I think our time is up for the panel discussion. Um, and, you know, really leaves me to thank you, Najib and Hanakata-san, for sharing your insights and for joining us today. The second half of this webinar uh, will be anchored by Mr. Sean Lee of Airbus. Um, Sean was uh, nominated as Head of Digital Solutions in APEC for Airbus in March 2021. And he's responsible for delivering customer success and satisfaction through adoption of digital solutions. And uh, this is a regional uh, responsibility, and he works particularly through partnerships and collaborations. Prior to joining Airbus, he was in the telecom sector, working on innovation and digitalization. So the perfect candidate, I think, for the job. Uh, so Sean, uh, a warm welcome to you. And uh, may I turn the time over to you to share with us what Airbus is doing, both to support its own operations and also importantly to support your customers to embrace uh, digital transformation. Thank you, Mr. Siang, and greetings to everyone. My name is Sean, and uh, I'm part of the Airbus Digital Solutions team in Asia Pack. And um, our role is mainly to help our customers with digital transformation, leveraging on our Airbus digital capabilities that we have today. So what I will cover today is uh, we'll first look at a quick introduction of SkyWise, understand what is SkyWise and how we are using SkyWise. And I will then share some of the uh, digital transformation uh, journey observations that we have made along the way when we embark on projects with our customers. And lastly, also some of the challenges and risks that we experience. So hopefully that will help everyone to you know, uh, avoid it uh, while you are going through your digital transformation journey. So without first ado, let's do a SkyWise video. In today's world of aerospace, Every product consists of thousands of parts provided by hundreds of suppliers. Maintenance services monitor the health of every aerospace product via thousands of onboard sensors. When a sensor signals dysfunction, an operator is alerted. Most of the time, the issue is quickly fixed with the original equipment manufacturer's help. But when the problem affects several systems, it's nearly impossible to quickly find and fix the root cause. Data exists at every stage of a product's life cycle, from any supplier's information to the latest test back to the design office or the assembly line. Airbus linked up with the global big data specialist Palantir, beginning in its own factories. Together, they created Skywise, a highly effective management platform which offer a single access point to share information, conduct data analysis, and enable informed decision-making and collaboration throughout the whole chain. 
Imagine what's possible for suppliers with wider access to Airbus data, powerful analytics for informed decision making. For airlines, solving complex problems no longer means endless exchanges that take months or even years. For operators and suppliers, connecting operations data to a dedicated and secured platform means seamless access to data, expertise, and analytics insight. Inquiries are shortened from years to weeks, from months to days, or even hours, with dramatic cost savings. Failures are anticipated before they actually occur. The smooth operational flow generates huge savings and happy customers. With Skywise, the operator's exact needs are finally at the heart of the design for future products and service solutions. So I hope that gives us a rough idea of what Skywise is. So um, as we can see, um, Skywise provides and links up all key players within the ecosystem and are providing them with different capabilities to allow them to build on top of what we already have today. So linking all the data together, putting them in a logical manner and um, connecting every single point of the data uh, help us to enable to share this data or to make this data, uh, put this data to better use and to help us with many of those use cases. Like for the airlines, we will see that you know we can we can use this data to help us to do predictive maintenance to improve our maintenance uh, capability. And also, for example, for the airport, it allow us to use the census data that we are receiving from the ground equipment to optimize the operations. Now, among all the players, Airbus is also using Skywise internally, and we are using that in terms of helping us to um, operate more effectively or put to be able to improve our productivity level. And we are also using all the feedbacks that we are getting from the aircraft when they are in operations to help us to improve our aircraft design as well. So it is really an end-to-end -end, um, uh, ecosystem that we're looking at and how Skywise can help us is really, we put these all data points together, produce and uh, uh, improve them and also enhance the data set and at the same time, you know, we introduce tools to allow us to um, explore all this data and also to build more use cases on top of it. So these are some of the technologies that we can also integrate easily to Skywise. So Skywise also opens to us more integration capability, like for example, allowing us to use advanced analytic or big data engines to do um, analysis and also um, integrating to 3D printing capability for additive manufacturing or things or, or the other internet of things sensors that will enhance the data set, producing more information. So all this linked data point allow us to not only enrich the data sets, continue to enrich them. It also allow us to bring this data set, uh, enhance them and make them available for different use cases. So it is really a two way thing that Skywise has enabled us. Now, some of the observations that we have made when we embark on this digital transformation journey with our customer, and I'll just uh, quickly go through four of them. Now, what we observe is that when, when, we, when we started to employ digital solutions in the operations or in the business, we started to collect a lot of this feedback, right? So the system will provide a means for making informed decision. So, you know, and we will also capture the decision that's being made and at the same time, the impact of the, of the decision. And this automatically helps us to build a knowledge-based system, allowing future um, decision make to be based on this knowledge base instead of a rule base. And that uh, helps us to really um, be able to uh, scale and to be able to um, move faster or make better decisions for future uh, business decision or situation that we are facing. Now, at the same time, um, what we, what we have observed is that, you know, with the employment of the expert system like the Skywise Predictive Maintenance, Skywise Health Monitoring, where we will provide recommendations based on the uh, information that we receive from the sensors, past decision made, and etc. It helps our um, customers or even ourselves to be able to adapt or, or, or you know, react faster 
to situations or different business conditions. So these are all um, um, one of the key benefits that we have observed uh, when we started to employ digital solutions in our digital journey. Now, at the same time, what we see is that uh, not only that we are able to monitor our product improvement through our own uh, manufacturing process or even uh, our own test flight, uh, we are now able to monitor the product performance from end to end, from the time the product is being designed and to the time where the product is being uh, dismantled. Right? And we'll be able to know what are the, what are the root causes to some of the uh, common issues faced and improve them in our design or to improve that in our technical docu documentation, helping our customer to react better when you know, they are facing some issues with our product. We have also um, observed that uh, given the um, better decision-making or better maintenance process, um, our customer is able to realize the full product potentials. So, you know, um, when, the, when a product is uh, uh, pro uh, providing, uh, for example, a 1,000 flight cycle uh, commitment to the performance, we do see that we are um, realizing the full potential at this and whenever we employ a better maintenance uh, routine or make decision, better decision during the maintenance process. And lastly, we also observe that you know, some of the uh, initiatives that we have uh, created within Skywise uh, have helped us to uh, contribute to the uh, sustainability topic. For example, we have uh, solutions on Skywise that enable us to look at all the, um, how the um, different cargoes or different uh, or passengers is being placed on the aircraft uh, to provide them a better uh, optimization uh, strategy for center of gravity. And that in turn help us to you know, um, um, uh, reduce our carbon footprint uh, by burning less fuel for the flight that has been taken. So these are the key observations that we made and uh, we think uh, you know, we, will, we will continue to observe more and more benefits on Skywise. And lastly, I also touch on uh, some of the challenges that we face. So I'll go from uh, bottom up uh, in a clockwise manner. So first of all, digitization. Uh, why is that a challenge? Because today, uh, a lot of the uh, procedures, process, we are still uh, paper-based and they are not in a digital or in a structured format. Uh, that is one of the key challenges where we need to do data capture. And how do we digitize all this written data into a structured digital format? And a lot of time you have to employ uh, solutions like uh, you know, optical character reader or even a natural language processor to convert this unstructured data into a structured one for, for processing. Uh, at the same time, uh, we also realized that uh, while it is uh, a lot of this initiate, digital initiative seems to be exciting and good, when you get into the business case building, uh, you will find that you have difficulties in uh, monetizing uh, all these um, benefits. For example, you know, if I were to say that oh, we are, we can have uh, this initiative would be able to save us fuel in terms of uh, you know the operations, and how do you then uh, prove that? the reduction in the fuel utilization is uh, uh, you know, contributed by this uh, initiative that you have uh, employed. Because a lot of times there are many moving parts, whether or not you have optimized your center of gravity, whether or not you, know, you have uh, done certain maintenance uh, optimally and et cetera. So it, it does not really, um, you, it's very difficult to pinpoint that a particular initiative has contributed and have, uh, you'll be able to monetize that uh, in terms of benefits. Uh, another big challenge that we will, we have uh, experienced is also the cybersecurity. So um, you know we all, when we are implementing a lot of our digital uh, transformation system, we realize that you know there are uh, vulnerabilities and more vulnerabilities continue to appear along the project or even after the project has been commissioned. And this is one of the key issues that is ongoing. You know even when uh, you are already using the platform. Now, also, we are looking at uh, how we can protect intellectual property because by connecting many data together, you create, uh, you uh, sometimes inevitably uh, expose some IP and how you can then protect them and make sure that you know, they don't get uh, misused or they don't get uh, uh, released in such a way that they're not supposed to be. So it is another area that we have to protect as well. Now, uh, as we move 
more and more use cases into digital use cases, you realize that there is a need to uh, put in guidelines and regulations to govern and make sure that nobody misuse the platform or misuse the data. And all these regulatory requirements will continue to evolve in the next few years. So how is the system that you are going to design and deploy today going to adapt and, and evolve and be able to comply to the future regulatory requirements is another challenge that we are facing and uh, we have recognized that it is one of the key challenges. And lastly, um, how do you put in proper data governance uh, rules or even implementation to make sure that you know, data that are not supposed to be accessed by a certain individuals uh, will not uh, be assessed by the individual and making sure that, you know, uh, when we employ a rule in a particular data, they are only for need to basis and make sure that uh, we do not uh, just share data openly without, uh, you know, uh, any governing on the data. So all these challenges are real and uh, we have experienced them and um, to, to, we have invested heavily in, uh, you know, addressing all these challenges. So by sharing all this, I hope that, uh, you know, for um, everyone who's embarking on the digital transformation journey, uh, when you do your budgeting, you do a business case uh, building, uh, you will also take all this into consideration. So it, budgeting for a project is no longer just budgeting for the hardware, for the software, for the services like penetration tests. It, you also have to cater budget to continue to um, employ services or maybe uh, uh, do modification to address all these risks and challenges that would evolve along the way, even when the platform has been commissioned. Well, um, the good news is that uh, Airbus have invested heavily in, in all these aspects. And uh, the reason why we uh, are offering Skywise as a platform to our customer and our partners is we do not want everyone to go through and make the same kind of investment. Why, why, why you know, reinvent the wheel over and over again? We hope that with SkyWest platform, uh, we can help our customers and our partner focus on the use cases or focus on the implementation of the solutions rather than you know, uh, spending uh, money and investment uh, on or, or addressing all these challenges and risks. So um, with that, uh, I will close my session uh, and uh, thank you and hand over back to Mr. Xia. Thank you, Sean, uh, for that presentation and insights into the progress that Airbus is making with its uh, digital platform uh, known as Skywise. Um, I'm, I'm curious, um, what is the adoption rate of Skywise among your customers and how long has it been out in the market? Um, and, and if I may tag on a second question relating to that, you know, what kind of benefits uh, are your customers seeing um, in the adoption of Skywise? Okay, so the first question, uh, today the adoption rate, uh, I do not have it in percentage, but uh, we already have uh, more than 140 customers and partners on the Skywise platform. And uh, we, have, uh, we have achieved what we call the critical mass, um, meaning to say we have more than 9,000 aircraft today connected on Skywise, giving us um, enough data points to do big data analytics and to uh, generate intelligence out of it. Um, some of the key benefits that we see today is, uh, you know, where we, when we look at uh, our customers or how we, uh, our customers are using Skywise, um, they are not, they, they no longer operate in silo or they do not just look at only their own data because Skywise uh, having data from uh, everywhere is allowed, is, is enabling what we call the benchmarking. So when I'm looking at particular issues, I can benchmark against the rest of the world or someone uh, uh, that might be in the same kind of operating environment as me. And that allows me to know uh, how far I should go or how much effort I should uh, invest in uh, gratifying or improving a particular situation. And um, lastly, um, I, I think for, um, for some of the... Uh, uh, key use cases that we look at, like uh, in a recent case where we look at the um, uh, the pandemic situation, uh, Skywatch was able to help our customer to react very quickly to the situation because we had an unprecedented situation of a lot of aircraft uh, parked on the ground, right? Uh, and and the aircraft are not are not meant to be parked on the ground; they are supposed to be flying. So how we organize all the parking, you know, and then how we uh, then uh, plan all the maintenance activities 
how you move all the aircraft to the hangar to bring them for maintenance, what are the maintenance activities to be carried out, the necessary logistics and everything. So we had this uh, parking and storage and this return to service application on Skywise that was uh, deployed within a month when, we, uh, when the lockdown happened and that helped our customer a lot. So that's how fast that we can react and the kind of benefits that can quickly be uh, uh, read when we, when we have a situation or a business uh, situation to handle. Well, thanks, Sean. I think that's, that's quite encouraging to learn that uh, critical mass has already been achieved uh, with 9,000 aircraft uh, uh, under Skywise. And in particular, I think uh, you know, it's, it's, it's heartening to learn that a tool like this is also seeing very good use in the uh, recovery phase of the industry, uh, restoring uh, aircraft to service uh, in a safe manner. Um, you shared earlier about the challenges of implementing a digital solution like Skywise, and I wish we had time to discuss all the very good uh, and interesting challenges. But if I may just uh, ask you on one, um, you know, because we realize that one of the most difficult aspects of digital transformation is the change management process. I mean, it's, it's not so much the technology, but it's often the culture, the organization uh, and people. Um, and how, do you have some insights to share about how customers uh, are going about implementing Skywise uh, successfully in their business and operations? How are they handling change management? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. In fact, uh, a lot of time, uh, a digital transformation journey is challenging, not because the uh, technology is not able to address the use case, uh, but rather like what you mentioned, it is a cultural shift that is uh, required to help us with this journey. Uh, I'll, maybe I'll share one very simple example. For example, you know, if we look at predictive maintenance and you have uh, the engineering team and also the maintenance team in, in, uh, in the airline, for example. Now, the engineering team would be looking at the accuracy of their engineering order being issued. So they, when, when they issue an engineering order after an investigation, for example, or to conduct an investigation, um, a lot of time they, are, they, they will want to look at how... Uh, how accurate they are or how, how much time they, they, they actually save by giving a very accurate uh, analysis or you know, recommended actions. Whereas on the maintenance team on the other, on the other end, uh, they are very much focused in carrying out the task and uh, by the issue by the engineering orders and also um, they, uh, how effective they are in terms of uh, their maintenance activities. So when we have a predictive maintenance uh, use cases deployed, you will then realize that oh, uh, the, the, the engineering team might not necessarily want to issue an engineering order for predictive maintenance activities. Like for example, go and investigate uh, a certain component because to them, they are, it is not a problem yet. So this is some of the uh, change that we, uh, some of the challenge that we face when we are employing uh, digital solutions. And I would say that what is required is really, it has to be a top-down or a cultural change that uh, within the organization. And uh, for that, you know, you, you will need to then, uh, for example, change the KPI that is measuring the engineering order for a start. Hmm. Thanks, Sean, for sharing the insight. I think this is a problem that, uh, you know, everyone is facing uh, yes. in terms of how to implement the transformation. So that will be a useful uh, <laughs> um, maybe I can squeeze in one more question, uh, given the time that we have. Um, you know, I was asking you earlier about the adoption of Skywise by customers and how they are implementing it. But can you also share how Airbus internally is using Skywise and how that's contributing to your own, uh, you know, uh, digital uh, transformation journey? Oh, okay. Um, I can't share too much detail. Maybe I'll share one use case. Uh, you know, for example, in the production uh, line, when we have when we are producing the components, uh, or even when we are assembling the aircraft, uh, many different data points are being captured, uh, and and all these data point, what happened previously was that they 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 were captured in silos, and they are they were not being analyzed uh, in totality. 
So with Skywise, what happened was that, uh, you know, we are able to put all this data together, connect them, and, and I'll do a, a, a very a quick and um, deep analysis on all this data. And the benefits is that, you know, a lot of time before even uh, we go for the test flight, we were able to identify uh, issues and rectify them, uh, you know, uh, and saving the, the trouble of going to the test flight and then observing the issues, then we come back and rectify them. So it is not only just helping us in terms of uh, optimizing the productivity, it is also helping us to reduce the uh, uh, carbon footprint during manufacturing process as well, because every test flight, you will create a certain level of uh, carbon footprint as well. So this is one of the use cases that we use Skywise within Airbus. And of course, there are many others, like you know, we also analyze the data when we design our new aircraft and et cetera. So um, we are using them in uh, many ways, and uh, I will see that uh, we are, will continue to expand the use cases on Skywise moving forward. Thank you so much, Sean, for sharing your insights about uh, how aerospace is adopting uh, digital solutions, and in particular, uh, the progress of Skywise, uh, especially among your customers. Uh, with that, I think uh, that's all the time we have uh, for, for discussion on, uh, with, uh, with you, Sean. And uh, I'd like to now uh, close the session with a quick summary. We had a very good discussion earlier with our friends from Malaysia as well as Japan. Uh, and I'm glad we were able to share about the progress of uh, the recovery as well as digital uh, transformation uh, in Malaysia, in Japan, and in Singapore. And then uh, we also heard from uh, Sean from Airbus discussing how uh, the digital solutions uh, service uh, Skywise is progressing um, and how that's making a significant change within the industry. Uh, I'd just like to close by saying then that, uh, you know, pandemic has hit manufacturing MRO, the supply chain, the aftermarket, uh, disrupting both cash flow of industry, but also, um, you know, uh, uh, creating great disruption in, in business. We expect, in fact, that the post-pandemic landscape will be quite different, right? Uh, the, the closing of international borders has also created a very significant difference between uh, the markets in manufacturing and aftermarket for single aisle as well as white bodies. And this is, uh, you know, uh, having a downstream uh, impact. So for Singapore, for example, where uh, our mainstay of our business is in MRO, um, obviously the, the business relating to white body work uh, has suffered more significantly uh, you know, because of the drop-off of international air travel. Uh, but at the same time, with the recovery of domestic uh, travel that, that's been uh, creating uh, impetus for recovery. Um, now, even as we welcome the recovery of uh, air traffic to 2019 levels and airlines are looking to turn a profit in 2023, we think that the crisis has created opportunities to rebuild the industry in a more sustainable manner. It's created new markets for innovative technologies and digital solutions. And uh, during the pandemic, uh, the industry has also invested at downtime in accelerating digital transformation. So, and we're really looking forward to how this is creating a journey that will, uh, will uh, see lasting change. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar and staying with us throughout. I hope this has contributed to your learning and uh, welcome you um, uh, to, to attend other ITAP sessions uh, uh, during this week. Thank you so much. <laughs>